Tante, Kidinas Gumit Nawa Nitotamak. Good evening. The Manitoba Museum acknowledges we are on Treaty One land, the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe and the Ninawak. These lands are the unceded territory of the Dakota and the homeland of the Metis Nation. The museum is committed to reflecting the continued legacy of all the original peoples of this province, including the Adenawak, Denisulin, Anishinawak, Inuit, and Nakota peoples. We acknowledge the harms of the past and are committed to improving the relationship in the spirit of reconciliation and appreciate the opportunity to live and learn on these traditional lands in mutual respect. And I know we hear this same sort of talk at many events and I really, I, th I think the, the Manitoba Museum in our renewal has really sort of embodied this sort of reconciliation approach to how we did our exhibits. And so as we tour around the galleries tonight, I really hope you get to see how much effort was put into that part of it. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening. My name is Caitlin Ayello and I'm the membership coordinator at the Manitoba Museum. I want to welcome you all to the sneak peek at the new Prairies Gallery opening on April 8th. For tonight's agenda, I'll be starting with a 25 minute video of the Bringing Our Stories Forward vision, the completion of the museum's capital campaign project, along with the museum tour video hosted by our upcoming uh, Chief Executive Officer, Dorita Blumchinski, and the museum curators discussing about the new changes. After the video, we'll have an opportunity to do a live Q&A with Kevin Brownlee, the Curator of Archaeology, and Diana Bizetsky robinson uh, Curator of Botany. If you have any questions about the artifacts or the specimens shown in the video, or you'd like to ask any questions about the new Prairies Gallery, please type them in the chat below uh, or hold on to them until the end of the tour when we can answer it. So now, without further delay, let me queue up the video and we can get on with this tour. Let me just get this done. You know, like everyone else, when we saw it, we were awed by it. The changes that have happened are blowing me away, and I'm somebody that's that's more connected. Um, so for people that haven't been for a while, this is a totally new experience. Whether you're two years old or you're 85 years old, there's something special here for every single person that comes to this museum now. Manitoba is an interesting province. To me, it's the center of our country, um, geographically, politically, culturally. To me, what struck me is that is, I, is to say, okay, this is what it was, this is where we are today, and boy, is that different. What's this gonna look like in 20 years? Well, it all depends on what we do. I think the importance of a, of a place like the Manitoba Museum is that it, it teaches you that the stories of history can change as people people's perspectives change. It's how we interpret them. It's how we use that history to learn and how we use it to make ourselves more understanding and better people. Bringing Our Stories Forward does a tremendous job of, of bringing those varying stories forward um, and showing how people have changed and evolved because of that. The curators, all the staff, the technicians, the carpenters, they have, have really done a, a wonderful job with, with this renewal. If you talk to any of them, they kind of hold it real dear to their hearts. It's not just a bunch of bricks and mortar and artifacts. It is really a, a place I, I know they love to come to be and, and, and spend time. It's amazing what they've been able to accomplish with the changes that have been made. museum is it's, it's our province's largest classroom you know we have over 80,000 students come through this facility on an annual basis so it, there's a great need to educate and tell people the history of, of, of Manitoba 
the vision that the curators and the, the staff of the museum had in taking a term such as bringing our stories forward and converting it into what we're now seeing as finished galleries with these stories, they've done a tremendous amount of work and they've done it very well. We're very fortunate to be to have a place like this. We've been very fortunate to have the, have the leadership that's got us where we are today. I think that our community is going to rush in the doors, and I think they're going to really be pleased with what the museum's got to present. Without the people that stepped up, without the, the three levels of government, without the big foundations, without the corporations and, and small business, without the individuals, none of this would have been possible. So to that group that had the foresight and had the commitment to the community to see the change made this possible and uh, we owe them a, a big vote of thanks. Thank you. Let me just queue up the next video for you guys. I'm Dorota Blumczynska, the incoming CEO of the Manitoba Museum, and I could not be more excited for what we're doing today. The museum's curators and I are giving you a virtual tour of the Bringing Our Stories Forward Renewal Project. Let's get started. So Maureen, I, I see these beautiful pipes and they're also pictured in these images with children and community. Can you tell us about that? And the pipes are here as part of a treaty exhibit that was a project of the Manitoba Museum and the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. They have an elders council and what we wanted to do something about treaties and I worked with those elders to find a way to talk about treaty. The pipes are sacred objects. There had to be a way of showing Indigenous agency in treaty making. So they talked about it for quite a while. The question was like, can we put pipes on display? They're sacred, you know, they're alive. And um, and one of the elders finally, his head popped up and he said, well, you know, we don't let her put those pipes on display. Our kids will never see them. And they put me in touch with Charlie Nelson, who is in those photos. And uh, the first ceremony is to speak to the pipes, because what's really happening is we are asking these pipes as living beings to perform in the museum on behalf of Indigenous people. The first ceremony took place here. They were smudged, they were sung to and so on. But then the second year when we were setting up the permanent exhibit, I, it was like 25 elders came all the way to Winnipeg for that. And so I said to Charlie, well, I could come to you. And so he said, what a good idea. Let's do it in the school. There were a hundred kids in the room. And at a certain point, these pipes, uh, which are kind of nominally alive when they're apart, when they're together, they're really alive. He laid the pipes when they're together on the ground and he touched each one of them. He said, you know, they're going to be behind glass for a whole year. They need human touch. Everybody in the room, 130 people, they've just formed this kind of reception line and spoke to and touched all the pipes, put tobacco in them and passed them around the room. And they made relationships with the people who smoked them that have lasted for now seven years. We go back and do that ceremony every year. They had absolutely the best send off. These objects have community and it's our obligation to bring that community into the museum. It is what we come upon when we first enter the museum and it speaks so much to our relationships today and and the significance as as treaty peoples in treaty number one territory and can you can you expand a little bit on you know why is it that we want every visitor to the museum to enter through this lens this understanding this knowledge it's a sincere thank you to the people who are here first but this is our gesture to all of our visitors that you're on treaty land so 
So, Diana, I see this beautiful case. How did you select the objects to be displayed here? To help orient people to what we have in the museum and what they're going to be seeing. So in total, we have eight galleries and each of these galleries has its own separate section in the case and the objects inside are basically iconic items that uh, sort of describe or, or uh, illuminate the theme of those different galleries. There are these very specific names and can you help us understand a little bit about what they represent, what story do they tell about Manitoba? Well, the names on the batters represent the eight different galleries that we have. The Earth History Gallery is the gallery where we talk about history of, uh, of life on Earth. And four of the galleries, the Arctic and Subarctic, Boreal, Parklands, and the Prairies Gallery are galleries that talk about certain geographical areas in Manitoba. The three other galleries represent specific collections. The Nonsuch Gallery, for example, is uh, the gallery containing our ship. The HBC Collection is a specific collection that we got from the Hudson's Bay Company. And of course, the Winnipeg Gallery features human history of the city of Winnipeg. Hi, Kevin. Hi. So can you tell us about this incredible exhibit and tell us why it is that we are at the edge of a river? Yeah, th this is a site that's located just uh, in the really southwestern corner of Manitoba, just south of Maletta, on where the Souris River is currently eroding uh, this really important site. It was first discovered by farmers in the area and pulled to my predecessor, and he was a PhD student at the time, Dr. Lee Sims, working in southern Manitoba at that time on his dissertation. And after seeing the site, he was impressed and blown away and decided to spend three years working on it. As he worked on it, and and sort of at the end of it, during his, his PhD, he had it nominated and got accepted as a National Historic Site, and which is important for a couple of reasons. One, I think the most important is that it is a Indigenous or First Nation site being recognized. And it was one of very few in 1973 that were actually given that status. It was mostly uh, to colonial and settler places were the, the focus at that time. So it was sort of a, 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 an important one on that. You know, we've recreated it here. We really wanted to bring part of this sort of area Area out to uh, visitors who come here. So this big thick layer that goes all the way along is 1100 years old uh, at the site and is sort of the record of uh, a major communal bison hunting that happened. And so a, a large group of First Nation peoples would have congregated and gathered and made one of these sort of towns, which is sort of a corral, and they would run the bison over the hill. Uh, much less dramatic than Hit Smashed In that people might be more familiar with in Alberta. They would run them down into these pounds uh, and this provides provided immense uh, quantities of food and food, food stability. And so we always talk about sort of like food security today. You know, the, a successful hunt allowed this group to have food security. Almost all of the bones that we see are bison bones because that's what they were hunting. But then you get a few other sort of bits and pieces as you go through and do the analysis. We've found uh, dogs, coyotes, wolves, uh, the teeth of some grizzly bears. So a grizzly bear was coming to this place. Um, and so yeah, a nice range of different animals. So Graham, this looks very heavy. Uh, it looks like a home and I understand that it's from Melita and that it is both uh, geology and history. Could you tell us more about that? Well, from very early on in this project, we wanted to feature field stone because it's such a characteristic material in Southwest Manitoba and used in a lot of buildings. Now, in, in terms of why this particular house in Melita, uh, behind me on the other side here, we have the Brockington site, which is a, a depiction of this fabulous bison kill site, hundreds of years old. And just above that site is a stone house. And since we wanted to feature field stone, and since we had this, this feeling of all these layers of history we could see at Brockington, that we could have the Brockington site and have the stone house. And then of course the stone house features material that's millions to billions of years old. So we have that layer of history built in. So it's sort of, sort of full circle, earlier humans, later more recent uh, settlers and then those settlers using material that that had been here for a very long time 
So Diana, I can see here that we've got these incredible grasses and we've got the top and the root. Can you tell us why? Well, one of the things we like to do with the museum is to give people a different perspective of nature that they might not normally be able to get. And uh, a long time ago, I read a wonderful article in National Geographic about plant roots. And I just found the photographs showing these entire plant roots fascinating. And I wanted to sort of recreate that experience for our visitors by digging up some actual native uh, grasses and, uh, and an herb actually, so people could really see uh, what they normally look like. So these are real root systems? Yes, I took a crew of people out to Spruce Woods Provincial Park. We got a permit to collect these plants. None of them are rare or endangered. And in fact, uh, two of them were eroding out of the sand dune and were probably going to die shortly. So we didn't feel quite so guilty about uh, digging them up. And we brought them back to the museum, uh, wrapped in towels to keep them moist, and then we plunged it into a special pickling solution. So they're basically mummified plants. And the reason we do that is so they won't decompose over the years. They should stay nice and fresh for many years to come. That's incredible. And just looking at the picture behind, I can see that, you know, our, our beautiful prairies are so much made up of grasses and less so trees. Can you tell us why? Well, there are basically three things that really impact plants on the prairies. Uh, number one, there used to be a lot of forest uh, or a lot of grass fires. Number two, there was a lot of grazing by bison, of course, and grasses are actually much better at withstanding those kinds of uh, disturbances, more so than trees do. And the other key thing is drought. Prairies, of course, can be very, very dry. And grasses and forbs have much more extensive root systems than trees do. And that enables them to get uh, a lot more water and uh, basically gives them a competitive edge. I see there's this incredible portrait of Chief Forever Thunderbird. Can you tell me about it, please? Uh, Gagi Gepane was one of the men who signed Treaty 1. And uh, he was a uh, a uh, trade captain for the Hudson Bay Company before he was a person who would have participated in treaty making before the number of treaties began. He was very respected and uh, he was also, he had, he's hard to track in the historical record because he was also called Tom, a William Mann, he was also called William Pennefather. And, um, and you know, and then he had his own Ojibwe name, probably more than one. <laughs> the photograph is from the 1870s, and the family looked after it for 140 years before it came to us. And uh, they, they, I, I, they had offered this medal that we have here, a medal that's a commemorative medal from the uh, 1901 royal visit. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, we have a, had a photo of Grandpa, but we, my dad loaned it to somebody at the university student there. He never gave it back. I, you know, would you try to find that? You know people there, I don't. And so it, it, Ted and Rachel Mann, they're just lovely people. Anyway, I, so I went to the university and I said, listen, if you, would you look for this? I think it's here. And uh, about three weeks later, I met the woman who's the head of Native Studies in the grocery store. And she said, you won't believe it. <laughs> we were cleaning up the library and on top, the top shelf just absolutely covered in dust was this photograph. And if you hadn't asked me for it, I wouldn't have known what it was. And so, uh, so anyway, we figured out that it was indeed the, the, the actual portrait. You know, there was a certain amount of negotiation. The university wanted to hang on to it. They wanted to duplicate it. And finally, Ted said, no, it's mine. And so it went to the family. And they had it for a couple of months. And they they really felt the pressure of looking after it. Uh, they were worried about the value of it. And, and then finally, they said, you know, the museum is the right place for this. You need to tell the story of our family. And you need to tell the story of Forever Thunderbird. You know, we need that story to be in the museum and in the public, and we want to share it with you. Uh, so I understand that these are burrowing owls. Are these common or are they rare in Manitoba? Well, burrowing owls are uh, actually quite rare in Manitoba now. They used to be quite uh, widespread, uh, even known to breed in Winnipeg. Funny little owls in that they're the only owls in Canada that nest underground. So they use Richardson's ground squirrel burrows here in the province and modify them to lay their eggs and look after their young, keep them safe. So is that why in the picture they're featured on the ground in front of the cattle? 
That's right. They do use uh, grazed areas frequently, especially now because there's so little of our prairie landscape left. We've really transformed the prairies quite dramatically. And so a lot of birds like burrowing owls and other birds that rely on the grasslands have become quite rare. And we really need to, the, the reason we put this part of the gallery together was to have people rethink their relationship to the grasslands, to the prairies that we think we know and change our, our ways a little bit and try to help uh, some of these rare birds. Um, so I understand that we're going to take a look at a very important exhibit, but before we do, can you tell us what is a mini diorama? Well, a mini diorama is very much like a big diorama, except it's miniaturized to a very, very small scale. And this allows us to see a large panorama of a scene in the past. So that's what's really great about mini dioramas, is you get to see a lot more. But the thing with mini dioramas is that to, to see them correctly, you have to see them from a very particular angle. And so there's always a, a particular viewpoint that you should be looking through, and that's what we have here. Wonderful. And so what exactly are we looking at in here? We're looking at Winnipeg in 1870. So it wasn't a big city at this point. It was more like a large village. And uh, the, you're looking at it from the point of view east of the Red River, looking west over the river into uh, downtown Winnipeg. And so what you would see today is um, Juba Park and then all the buildings behind that. So it's a really interesting view and uh, there's lots to see. Roland, I see this incredible stained glass. Where did this come from? This was originally above the double door entrance to the old city hall building. And it was built, uh, the building was built in 1886, but the window itself was put in in 1903. And then when that city hall was demolished in 1962, these were preserved, and then uh, it eventually came to the Manitoba Museum. And I see that our city crest is right in the middle. Can you describe that to us? Can you tell us the significance of the crest? Mm -hmm. The crest was made in 1873, uh, just as Winnipeg became uh, incorporated as a city and it has a bison, a train, and three sheaves of wheat. And these were very aspirational symbols for the city. Although the bison were largely gone from Manitoba at that time, uh, they knew that it was really important for the early uh, economy of Manitoba. Also, uh, they hoped that trains would come. There were no trains anywhere near Winnipeg at this point, uh, but they did come four years later. And then uh, the sheaves of wheat were supposed to be the bounty of the harvest that would make Manitoba a wealthy province. And that wasn't happening yet either at this stage, but they really hoped that it would, and eventually it did. So, Randy, I see this beautiful display case. Can you tell us um, what kind of species are in here? How many? Uh, well, the exact number of species, I probably couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I can tell you there's about 500 different individuals that are pinned uh, onto the wall here to give people an idea of the diversity uh, that can occur in the boreal forest. And even though there's 500 specimens here, uh, it's really only a very small fraction of the number of species that you can find in the boreal forest, probably more than 20,000 species. Uh, and museum and other scientists are finding new ones all the time. So how do our visitors react? Well, we get a really great reaction to this exhibit. Uh, we designed it especially so people could really cut, get up close and personal with some of these insects because um, they're usually very small. Uh, so we're always gratified to see little nose prints on the glass, uh, especially, you know, kids really love this exhibit. Um, but even adults uh, really come away with a completely different appreciation for uh, insect diversity and just the beauty of it and in intricacy of their, their wings and uh, their antennas. And, um, and so it's really been a, a, a fantastic, uh, yeah, it's really worked very well for us. Which is your favorite? 
Well, it's pretty hard to pick a favorite, uh, but I'd like to point out a couple that aren't necessarily the ones that people think are beautiful. Um, so there's a couple of little black ones here, and these are uh, black fire beetles. Um, and these are amazing little critters because they have infrared sensors on their legs. Um, and they're able to uh, sense forest fires. So they actually congregate at forest fires to mate and then lay their eggs uh, on uh, even hot, still hot wood, uh, because that's the way their, their larvae have to develop. And so the, the, these little infrared sensors actually help them even avoid the really hot uh, trees. Um, and then there, the other one that I really like is another black one right here, um, and that's in the exact opposite direction. These can produce chemicals that help them uh, avoid freezing. And so they can withstand temperatures down to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and so they can get through our winters pretty easily at that, at that rate. But I like to point those out because they're not the most beautiful. Yeah. Um, but uh, even these, what people might think are sort of boring looking insects, have really fascinating life histories. Hi, Amelia. Hi. So we have such a beautiful view of the gallery here and of the ship. What has changed? Well, it's pretty exciting actually. We wanted to retain the nostalgic feel that a lot of people have with the gallery. So instead we went with a lot of um, surround sound. It's a whole new soundscape experience, a whole new light show. So you're actually experiencing different times of day in Deptford. So you get all the sounds of a bustling village. You get even a thunderstorm coming through. Like it's just a, a really much more immersive experience than it used to be. And I'm seeing birds and bugs and every kind of critter. Tell us about that. We wanted to really talk a little bit more about how broad Hudson's Bay Company really went and so it was a super fun collaboration with Randy uh, he got to bring in some of the zoological specimens and I brought in the HBC artifacts because what's interesting about their history is that a lot of Hudson's Bay Company employees were actually scientific collectors so a lot of these specimens birds and bugs that you see at museums like the Smithsonian and even London and British Museum they were collected by fur traders and they knew about these specimens from the indigenous guides that they met when they were here in what's now Canada. So some of these cases contain beautiful, yeah, birds and bugs that were collected by fur traders. Amazing. And looking at these beautiful ships, one in particular stands out, that tiny little beauty. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's one It's one of my favorites. And I mean, all the model ships are pretty incredible, but this, this one in particular, it's carved out of ivory. And what I love about it is where all of these are kind of Euro-Canadian carvers that that carver is a Chuchki carver from Siberia. So it's an indigenous carver who saw the SS Bay Chima, which was a Hudson's Bay Company ship when they were making their Russian enterprise. Uh, and he obviously was quite taken with it. So he carved a little model of the, of the Bay Chimo. The detail is incredible since it's probably not like he had a lot of time to study it, um, but it's just a beautiful little model made by an indigenous carver and I, I love it. I'm so impressed with the Bringing Our Stories Forward renewal. It's just amazing to see what's been accomplished here. But trust me, what we saw is just the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to get the full experience of what the Manitoba Museum has to offer, you'll just have to stop in for a visit. I hope you all enjoyed those videos. I'd like to welcome Diana uh, Bizetsky robson uh, the curator of Botany, who will be starting off the live Q and A with us in the Welcome Gallery. As many as you guys gallery, as many, yeah, I'm going over my words right now. As many of you guys know this as the Bison Diorama um, Gallery, but there are some couple noteworthy changes that we'd like to share with you. Diana is eager to answer your questions, so feel free to type them in the chat. And without further delay, I'd like to virtually welcome you to the Welcome Gallery. Now, hello, Diana, how are you doing tonight? Uh, hello, I'm doing well. Wonderful, that's wonderful. So we definitely have some questions for you. Okay. Um, so my question for you is, how did the curators decide what artifacts or specimens the museum would put in these cases? Well, it was easy for a few of the galleries because we had some, some 
pretty iconic objects um, that just scream to be displayed. Uh, one of them, for example, is the Nonsuch Gallery uh, rigging model. And uh, that was just a, a wonderful thing that we had in the back. And uh, we thought, what a, what a better way to, to represent the ship than a teeny weeny little model of a part of it. Um, the other model was the City of Winnipeg model. We had just a, a beautiful model of the old City Hall um, that's since been torn down. And uh, we thought people would really enjoy um, seeing this model and uh, Some of the other galleries that were a little bit harder in our biome galleries. There, can you hear? We okay, can hear good. You now. <laughs> okay, with uh, some of the, the biome based galleries, like the Prairies Gallery, we had a harder time figuring out what to do because we have both human history and natural history. Uh, exhibits in the gallery and uh, we couldn't just decide on one piece. We decided to include a mixture of uh, a few different things to really try and um, give people a good idea of the sorts of things they're going to see in, in each of those galleries. Thank you so much, Diana. Now, what is your favorite artifact or specimen in the case? Ooh, um, well, since I'm the since I'm a botanist, I actually really like the moccasin flower model. It's a, a beautiful model that our diorama artist made years ago, and it was just sitting on a shelf. And I thought, oh, I want to get that out there for people to see. And what's wonderful is there's this um, pipe bag that has a little moccasin flower embroidered on it. So I thought that was uh, just wonderful to have those two objects together, because um, they really illustrate how Indigenous people were inspired by, um, by nature in their art. Thank you. Now, is there any noteworthy changes that you'd like our viewers to know about, about the new Welcome Gallery? Well, aside from these lovely brand new cases, we also have um, this wonderful projection on the wall. And we basically just wanted to tell the history of Manitoba very, very quickly. So we created this three minute video. Uh, what you're seeing right now shows uh, what Manitoba looked like about 3,000 years ago. And uh, the vegetation changed over time. And uh, all of those red dots, those indicate um, sites where Indigenous people were living that we have archaeological information for. And, uh, and yeah, there's all sorts of wonderful things. We go through time right up until uh, uh, contemporary times. And uh, it's uh, just a wonderful new feature. People can just get a good overview of Manitoba and learn a little bit more about what they're gonna see in the galleries. Thank you so much for that. Uh, is there any other viewer questions? I don't think there is about the Welcome Gallery. Um, so I will move on. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Diana, for your time. You're welcome, see you in a bit. <laughs> So um, now we would like to introduce to Kevin Brownlee, the curator of archaeologists, who will take, take us on a quick, quick journey uh, to the new Prairies Gallery, uh, opening to the public on April 8th. So that's when you guys can come and really get your you know, eyes and see everything there. Uh, Kevin and Diana will further answer your questions about the new gallery. So if you haven't already typed in your questions in the chat, please do so. And I'll uh, let Kevin just take it away for, for me. We're just sort of doing a quick uh, shortcut to get into uh, the, the new Prairies Gallery um, and sort of want to start here. Most people are familiar with our iconic sort of uh, pronghorn diorama that stays put. But one of the new additions that we have is as you come around uh, the sort of beginning part of it, we've got this incredible uh, mural by uh, Indigenous artist D. Barsi. Uh, which she sort of depicts what the uh, grasslands uh, maybe could have been. Uh, she's picked up on a number of the rare and endangered species, ferruginous hawk uh, and a western or a western prairie skink and a western skipperling, uh, the little uh, uh, an organism over there. And she really sort of captures how everything is interconnected, interlaked, uh, and how fragile this environment is. These are all rare and endangered species. And that's one of the messages that we really wanted to get across uh, in this gallery renewal was how, what a fragile uh, place this is and how so much of it has changed. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you, Kevin, for taking on us that, that lovely journey. Well, thank We're you, very Jess. excited to introduce you to the new Prairies Gallery, formerly known as the Grassland Galleries. Since I've been lucky enough to pre-preview pre the galleries beforehand, I think it'd be a good idea if I start off you with some questions and Kevin and Diana can take us around and then we'll open the floor to questions from the viewers. So hello, Diana. Um, we appreciate Hi. you joining us tonight. Um, we're very excited to, for you to answer some of our questions. Um, so my first question is in the tour video, uh, you talked about the pickling roots on display. Can you pick, uh, talk a bit more about this process and how it's done? Uh, sure, the pickling solution is a museum's pr proprietary formula, so even I don't quite know exactly what's in it. Um, and But what it does is it makes the roots nice and pliable and uh, prevents them from, from degrading. So um, after we put them in the pickling solution, they had to stay there for several months, and then our diorama technician had to take them all out and then untangle the roots and uh, stretch them out so that they... Uh, uh, they look all pretty. And then she actually had to do some painting because uh, plants, of course, tend to fade, um, especially when they're under harsh light. So she went in and she painted all of the little blades of the June grass and she painted all the leaves of the, uh, the white prairie clover and attached fake little petals to it. Um, so they'll, that's basically pretty much what it looks like when they're fresh and that's what they will permanently look like for the rest of their lives here in the museum. Thank you, Diana. We actually have a viewer question. They're asking if the mini diorama that Roland talked about was in the Prairies Gallery. Actually, it was in the very, it was in the old Winnipeg Gallery. Years and years ago, it was part of a, a Pepper's Ghost, which is basically two mini dioramas sandwiched on top of each other. Um, so we have one of those mini dioramas at the very beginning of the Prairies Gallery, and we have the other one at the end, because the, the Pepper's Ghost function wasn't really working properly. So we decided to, uh, to split them apart and show them separately. Thank you so much. Now, um, where am I going? Oh, yes. Uh, so we're gonna, I would like to chat about you about the, the Traveler and Plant exhibit uh, with traveling plants and funguses on display. So I would love to know uh, a little bit more about that uh, display. And then what is your favorite Traveler? So I've done a lot of pollinator work over the years here at the museum and one of the things we wanted to do in this exhibit was to actually show people some of the native plants of the prairies and some of the pollinators. Uh, if you look close at every single flower there actually are pollinators on there. Some of them are really well hidden and uh, are hard to see. Uh, my favorite specimen is the one Anya's uh, zooming in on. It's uh, Andrew's bottle genshin or closed genshin, and you can actually see a little bumblebee uh, climbing into the flower to, uh, to feast on the nectar inside. Um, so that's definitely one of my, one of my favorite specimens um, because you get to see the little, the little bumblebee bum. Thank you so much. And then in the galleries, there's a mention that there's over 700 wild species of plants that were replicated by, uh, or sorry, replaced by agricultural uh, crops. Can you tell us uh, how these crops were established in the prairies and how they were chosen to be cultivated? Sure, uh, so we're just gonna walk past our, our projection here over to an exhibit we have on the first farmers in Manitoba. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that the very first people to farm the prairies were indigenous people. Um, there's evidence of uh, crop fields and storage pits in, uh, in Manitoba. And uh, a few, there are a few native species that they actually would have been cultivating, including uh, sunflower and Jerusalem artichoke, um, another species called Pitsy goosefoot. So these are actually all native species that were grown here. And also corn, beans, and squash were imported um, into Manitoba from further south and uh, we're being grown here for a fair, fair chunk of time. And part of the reason why we know Indigenous people were eating corn here is because we found corn phytoliths on the inside of pots. So we know uh, corn was being eaten here uh, well before Europeans arrived. Thank you. Um, so in this display, uh, there's talking about the three sisters. Can you tell us more about these crops and how they improve the soil's fertility? 
Yeah, so uh, corn, beans, and squash are the three sisters. And they were called that because those three plants basically help each other uh, to grow. Uh, so the corn is, uh, is a very heavy, heavy feeding crop. It needs a lot of soil fertility and beans actually help fertilize the soil uh, with nitrogen. So growing beans with the corn basically helps the corn grow better. Um, squash grows low to the ground and it uh, basically helps uh, shade the soil and, and keep it moist. And the other wonderful thing is that if you eat those three foods together, if you eat a, a stew made with corn and beans and squash, we're actually getting a, a nutritionally a very complete a healthy meal with all the protein and all the carbs and really all the vitamins you need. So uh, indigenous people obviously recognize the importance of, of eating these three plants together and, and also growing them together. So I do have a viewer question from you. Um, they're they're okay. wondering how you preserve uh, something as delicate as fungi. Uh, it's, it's pretty tough. Some species don't do it very well. You basically have to dehydrate it really, really quickly. Otherwise, it, uh, it starts to basically turn into goo. Um, so one way you can do that is by using silica gel. Um, so I will sometimes uh, do that if, if, uh, if I'm dealing with something that really needs to be preserved quickly. Um, other fungus, you can wait a little bit longer, uh, put them in a dehydrating uh, oven, or they can even be freeze dried. So uh, we have specimens using all three strategies um, in display in the museum. Thank you so much. That was a very, very fun question. Um, so then what is your favorite artifact or specimen in the New Prairies Gallery that is not part of your research field and why? Um, I am going to just take you over here. Uh, one of the things that I love discovering were ooh, these beautiful pipe stone carvings. So this is one of the pipe stones. It's actually showing a, a carving of a deer in it. Um, this is in our Tracing Trade exhibit. There's another pipe stone with a Thunderbird on it uh, at the very, uh, very entrance of the gallery that I just love. So um, it's, it's just yeah, fascinating depictions of, of wildlife um, on these lovely artifacts. So if there's any other questions for uh, Diana, if you can please type them in. And uh, while we're waiting, let's just move on to Kevin, because I do definitely have some questions for Kevin as well. So please okay. type in any questions for Diana, and we'll get back to her about that, OK? Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? Very good. Good. So thank you so much for taking your time and being here today. Um, so uh, I have some questions. Um, the Suez River right behind you, the diorama that was created, um, were the bones on displays the ones that were actually found at the site or are they just replicas? Yeah, these are, are real bones from the site and we tried to sort of represent the different layers that sort of show up at the site as best we could. When we first visited the site in 2012, uh, a group of the curators, this site became an Im uh, immediate sort of must have for the gallery and really pleased to be able to sort of bring that part of the. Oh, we have a little bit of a, we can't hear you now. <laughs> good. You're good to go now. All right. All right. Yeah. So anyway, the, the, this really got us an opportunity to just sort of capture a moment in time at this at this site and bring it into the galleries for our visitors to see. And can you just tell us how this was created or anything like this? Yeah. Uh, so it was many trips by curators uh, and we sort of would map out and drew the various layers. And then we worked with a fabrication company uh, and then some uh, internal help from our uh uh, diorama artists uh, and was able to sort of recreate this and using real bones from the site, trying to represent the different pieces that we have. Um, not only is this the, this thick bison layer, which represents a communal bison hunt that happened somewhere around 1100 years ago, all the way up to sort of later occupation, right up to the time of sort of settler and when uh, the uh, fieldstone house that Graham talked about was produced at the site. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, the near 
the clay pot display, there's a wonderful video of uh, you cooking with Casey Adams. And can you tell us more about, to the viewers who have not seen the video, the process of cooking in a clay pot and how you learned that process? Yeah, um, I first learned it uh, from uh, friends and colleagues down in Minnesota, and they had been doing this for years. And, and I thought this was such an amazing process of being able to do that. And so a number of years ago, we uh, did actually a, 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 a stew in Cross Lake in northern Manitoba and worked with that uh, uh, Cree community. It was amazing. So we, we figured it was probably the first time in 300 years anyone had done it. And then uh, in prep of this one, uh, I was really fortunate to sort of partner up with Casey Adams and we were able to then uh, take uh, one of her pots and then cook a meal inside of that. And so, you know, it's very similar to how we would do a normal, uh, you sear the meat and cook it. But I think one of the beautiful things about the ceramics is how well it performs. Uh, it sat on the stove for three hours, didn't burn anything on the inside. And so, you know, the heat transfer and that kind of thing uh, is really spectacular. And so, um, yeah, every time we will cook in these pots, we certainly get a better appreciation of sort of the technology and sophistication that we have in uh, that First Nation people carried with them. Thank you so much. Um, and then, can you, because uh, you're right beside that beautiful display, can you uh, please tell us the process of reconstructing those clay pots and how did you decide what pieces went where when you find them all kind of like shattered or in little bits? That's a really good question. Well, it's, uh, I mean, proximity is one of these uh, things. So finding shirts sort of clustered together certainly helps us. We think they're part of the same one. Um, but it's, this is sort of like, uh, if you like jigsaw puzzles, this is to the extreme. Uh, you know, there is no pattern. Uh, you know, there is no box to follow. And so you go on sort of the surface finish or what does the surface look like? The feel, they have a different feel, but it does take hours and hours and hours of like slowly piecing these uh, pots together. Um, but what I really liked about this opportunity in this case was to then highlight some of the most complete pots that we have in the gap in the collection uh, from the grasslands uh, area. And so it really was a, 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 an opportunity. You know, the small shirts that we find at a site really don't engage with the public the way these reconstructed pots do. And so it, it's while it's a lot of work and effort, the end result is such a better way of communicating to the public. Thank you so much. Um, so there's a display on tradable goods and I'd love to know uh, what is your favorite tradable artifact and why? Well, I think I've, I, I've given, given it a little bit of thought. I think my favorite piece uh, is, there's many of them in this case, but I think the one that I really like the most is this um, uh, bit of jade. Uh, it's the only jade tool ever found in Manitoba. Uh, comes from BC and so where BC Jade comes from in, in uh, the interior of BC. And this example came from Melita area in the southwestern part of Manitoba and is the only example of uh, Jade known in Manitoba. And so it's really sort of, we are on the very edge of where this pot, this type of uh, stone uh, was, was traded into. That's wonderful. Um, can you also explain the process of the shiny quartz arrowhead and how it became glass-like? Yeah, it's more of a geological process than uh, a, a human story. Um, but we see this one that looks almost like sort of clear, like the bottom of a bottle. Um, and, you know, quartz shows up in a number of different varieties. Uh, and the uh, crystal quartz is sort of the purest variety. I think one of the things it does speak to is how when a person long ago was making this tool, they were selecting something that would make a beautiful piece. And so actually all of these ones that we've got on, exam on, on exhibit, you know, highlight the stone that they're using. And so these are not just sort of utilitarian pieces. These are works of art uh, uh, and where you're using the, the colors and the, the, the different sh uh, shading on them uh, to sort of bring, uh, uh, show, uh, how skilled you are as a craftsperson. Wonderful. And lastly, what is your favorite artifact or specimen in the New Prairies Gallery that is not a part of your research field and why? <laughs> um, I would have to say that it's going to be the uh, Hall uh, family teepee. So this is a, a piece that came to the Manitoba Museum uh, quite a few years ago, and it's one of the sort of icons that still remains today. 
Uh, and in this uh, piece, you know, I think the TP itself is this amazing sort of engineering feat. It's design and uh, stuff really speaks to sort of indigenous science and how they sort of mastered this sort of uh, technology and this sort of the, uh, this structure that is highly mobile and that kind of thing. So I love that. I'm a little bit selfish also because I have a connection to Mary Hall, who it was Mary and Solomon's uh, teepee when they gifted to the Manitoba Museum. And so uh, I've been connected to the family since I was born and my grandmother and Mary were very good friends. And so Mary was always sort of watching over me when I was growing up. And so this one has a bit of a personal connection as well. Thank you, Kevin. Now I have a quick question uh, from the Parks family that's wondering, do you know what the oldest artifact in the museum is? Uh, the oldest artifact from uh, within Manitoba is about a 12 and a half thousand year old spear point called Clovis. Um, but in the oldest artifact we have in the collection is probably more like 35,000 years old and comes from Europe. But that, you know, if we're talking Manitoba, 12 and a half thousand years. Thank you. And then they're also wondering, Kevin, do you know the process of replicating the layers on the wall? Was it the same as the rock wall in the boreal forest? No, this one, we the, the company did this all out in BC. Uh, and so they were never at the site to sort of take a peel. The one in boreal was actually uh, a, a mold was taken of that rock face and they peeled that back. And that process wasn't chosen on this one. And so they were trying to reproduce it based on the photographs and, and soil samples that we'd taken from the site. And then also Bill is wondering how many uh, years does the soils represent? Did you touch on that? Yeah, so it's the, the oldest layer of people at this site is 1100 years old, which isn't really all that old. Um, and, uh, but there, and then there's a, uh, a, a 1400 layer and a 1600 layer. Uh, and so, you know, these are all sort of separated by the clays. So every time the source river would flood, it would deposit these clays. And so each layer is sort of isolated from the other, but uh, yeah, 1100 years is the oldest. Thank you, Kevin, so much. Well, that's all the time we have for today. So uh, thank you, Kevin and Diana for both joining us. We, we appreciate it so much. And uh, I wanna say thank you all for, for joining us today uh, on this lovely uh, afternoon, Tuesday's afternoon. The Bringing the Stories Forward project began almost five years ago with the board and staff imagining what the most urgent needs were for the renewed Manitoba Museum. We knew that the museum galleries needed to be updated and the stories needed to be told in a new way that could connect with the present day audiences. Bringing our stories forward was created for a pathway towards renewal of over 50% of our galleries, galleries that inspire and impact over 360 100,000 visitors and over 77,000 school visits annually. On behalf of the board and the entire museum team, I want to thank our funders, the Government of Canada through the cultural, Canada's Cultural Spaces Fund and the Government of Manitoba and the Winnipeg Foundation, and all the donors who have made Bring Our Stories Forward a renewal project possible. Once again, thank you for joining us. The gallery, uh, the New Prairies Gallery will be opening April 8th, so that is in about two days time. Um, if you have any further questions about this tour, please feel free to uh, email membership at manitobamuseum.ca. I hope you guys had a wonderful evening and good night.